Oh, well, they will. So good morning, everybody. Happy Global Surveyors Day. Woo, use the cheer emoji and sh shout the streamers and do all that sort of stuff. Here we are celebrating all of you. Post in the chat below where you are dialing in from, uh, where in the world you're dialing in from. We have people from all over. Uh, I've seen people from all over Australia, which is great to have so many Aussies with us. We've got people from across New Zealand, uh, Canada, the different provinces in Canada are joining us. We've, we've even got a couple that we've managed to pull in from the US. Somebody from the Netherlands, how great to see you. Fabulous, fabulous to see you there. I know that we've got some from Singapore dialing in as well. Uh, and I think we might even have some from South Africa that I saw uh, in the registrations. So greetings, greetings to surveyors all over the world. It's absolutely wonderful to have you. And who would have thought 12 months ago, uh, we started having calls with our colleagues in Canada and it was great. And there was three or four of us, you know, and that was kind of pre-COVID. And here we are 12 months on and look how comfortable we all are dialing in via Zoom and we can actually talk internationally. And so I've only allowed an hour for this, but I think we could probably talk longer, couldn't we? Easily, we'll, we'll, we'll get started <laughs> in that. I just wanna say a special um, welcome to our guests, which I'll introduce to you one by one, but I just wanna formally acknowledge the couple of surveyors general that I can see in the room, Craig Sandy in Victoria and Michael Gadici down in Tasmania. Lovely to have you both in the room with us. Um, if there's any others, I'll mention you as the meeting goes on. But lovely, lovely to see so many of you here from around Australia and indeed around the world. Um, Global Surveyors Day, uh, as we mentioned in our alert during the last few weeks, was started by... Um, FIG, I think that's right, isn't it? They got the thing. Somebody probably knows better about that than me, about how that all worked. And we just saw it and we thought, what a fabulous opportunity for marketing. For those of you who know me, I'm all about the marketing uh, and how we can be promoting, surveying and sharing the message. So one of the things that we really want you to do today is get on social media and talk about why it's great to be a surveyor. We want to use days like today to really promote our profession so that we can recruit a lot more into the profession. So uh, we're going to, I'm going to ask you all please to keep your microphones muted. We're going to do 40 minutes of just chatting with our special guests and then we're going to open the floor for questions. Okay, so I'm going to ask you to raise your hand before you ask a question and then I'll ask you to unmute your microphone. Um, just so that we're going to have about 100 people on this call. We don't want it to get a little bit over uh, overbearing there so please uh, that would be great and we want to try and allow as much time as we can for everybody to ask their questions so over the last uh just myself. My name is Michelle Blitzovs and I'm the Chief Executive Officer at the Association of Consulting Surveyors here in Australia. Over the last 12 months, probably maybe 18 months, we've been on a little bit of a mission to connect with consulting surveyors in other parts of the world. And uh, I met Paul Turner, who came to our um, Excellence Awards a couple of years ago. Uh, and he and his lovely wife came over and celebrated with us and we talked about many of the similarities between New Zealand and Australia, of course, who are a part of our great Anslick family. Uh, and so we've been uh, on a journey talking with them and Carl Fox, who I don't think is on the call because he had a weather opportunity and he had to measure something in the sky and Brian Hammonds, you'd be all over it, but I don't know. Paul could maybe explain what he actually had to measure, but... I'm sure it has a very technical terminology there about what he's actually doing. Something to do with uh, a drone, which I'm sure the surveyors will understand. So that's right. He, that's he has right. to take the chance. That's right. So, uh, so he's out doing that. So he said he'll dial in uh, somewhere on the road <sighs> if he can do that. Um, and uh, so we've also been connecting with uh, New Zealand and Canada. And Canada was kind of the second one that, that we connected with. I'm just going to mute everybody. And when I call on you, you can unmute yourselves. Um, and so uh, Michael Thompson, who is the president of the association over there, we've been having a lot of chats and we have an MOU with Canada, which is fabulous. And we've been talking about how we could get people to go between, you know, and we invited him to our conference. He invited us to his conference. Both conferences were cancelled. 
such as life, but we hold out hope. Now with the New Zealand border open, we're ever optimistic that we can at least get to New Zealand. So that's very exciting. And then Kent Grow, uh, who you might see down the bottom there, um, he had this podcast called Geoholics Anonymous. And, you know, I listen to a lot of podcasts, most of you know, and I started listening to his. And then Michael was interviewed by him. And then Michael said, you should interview the Australians. And so we got an interview. And that's how we connected with Kent. And uh, and then pa that inspired Peter Cox here in Australia to start her own podcast. I don't know if that's actually true or not. But she did start a podcast called Defining Boundaries. And then Timothy Birch, who is the president of the Surveys Association in uh, the US, one of them. No, the national one, right, Tim? The national one. Because uh, they've got one in every state. Just for those of you who think we have too many surveying associations here in Australia, in the US, there's one in every state. So we are not alone. Um, and uh, he interviewed Peter. And so I got in touch with him and here we are. Basically, that's kind of how today came about. So LinkedIn is a fabulous tool. Uh, I actually think it's a fabulous tool for surveyors to be using to market. So, Michael, we're going to start with you, uh, Michael Thompson from Canada. Introduce yourselves and maybe tell us a little bit about how surveying is coping uh, under the current COVID restrictions and where your country's sitting right now. Thanks, Michael. Sounds good. Thank you, Michelle. Um, my name is Michael Thompson, Chair of Professional Surveyors Canada. Uh, we just have the, the one national advocacy body, um, not one for every province, so a little more under control there. Uh, my day-to-day -day job, I run a small survey company, seven people out of Southern Alberta near the Rockies. In terms of how we've been handling COVID in the survey industry, we've never really been shut down. There was a two week period a year ago in Quebec where they weren't able to do much, but the surveying industry um, has been been deemed pretty essential. So as long as construction and real estate is still moving, we're, we've still, still been working. I think there was a backlog back uh, about a year ago where a lot of the work just dropped, but the demand didn't drop. So that's just all move forward. And everybody's seen a little bit of an uptick lately, if anything. Um, there is the, we are reliant in the oil and gas industry and that has, was down before, uh, before COVID ever began. So there's that one sector that it's a pretty big sector that has been down, but even even there, they're seeing a little bit of a, a rebound. So overall, uh, not not too bad. We've we've even seen the side effect that a lot of people that Canadians that used to go down to Florida or Mexico for vacation don't really want to do that anymore. So there's been a bit of an uptick in vacation property sales that's uh, hitting our market as well. So doing okay. That's good. That's good. And we want to say welcome to Michelle also, uh, who you've got now in executive director position over there at the association. Is that your title there now? Fabulous, fabulous. So we'll look forward to working together more and more. That'll be great. Tim, Timothy Birch from um, the US. Why don't you introduce yourself and tell us how your state particularly and then maybe how COVID's impacting surveying across the US. Sure. Uh, my name is Timothy Birch. I, I'm going to, unfortunately, Michelle, I'm going to correct you just a little bit because if the current president finds out that I've been tabbed the president of the association, he'll, he'll have me drummed out on my ear. But oh, I am I president see. elect. Um, we carried over all the offices one more year just because of COVID. Uh, Mark Sargent is our current president from the state of New Hampshire. Um, yes, I am in Illinois, just outside of the city of Chicago. All the horrible things you've heard about the Americans and how stupid we are with COVID, it, they're all absolutely true, um, that we have no idea what we're doing and uh, we really don't care uh, for the most part. Um, that's not completely true, but um, they're going a little crazy in Florida right now, but uh, hey, it's spring break, what are you gonna do? Uh, we do have a pretty good uh, spread of the, uh, of, the, of the vaccine right now. Uh, I know Illinois has been, uh, uh, been pretty active and going forward with it. Um, you know, similar to what Michael said, we're, when it first broke, there was a, a just kind of a, a period of, oh crap, what are we going to do? Um, and then once we figured out that, that really realistically, I mean, and I'll be honest with you, there were, there was a debate on whether we were con really considered essential workers or not. 
I mean, what, what other profession out there that we're not out on our own, doing our own thing, staying away from people. Uh, most surveyors I know don't like people, so they try to avoid them as much as possible. So we were able to get deemed essential in most places. And like Michael said, it, there's actually been a, a little bit of a boom of, of, of work. Um, and that's probably, you know, that's some of the things we can get into later is uh, the shortage of people and the amount of work that's happening and really how the surveying profession has to be able to look within itself uh, and decide, are we going to recruit or are we just gonna let this thing fall off the table? Um, so unfortunately to have to go through what we did with, with, the, with uh, COVID was a bad thing, but I think it's really given us an opportunity to work remotely, show what technology can do and really try to bring some people together on that you know, this is a crazy world, and we got we have to work together on some of this stuff. So, um, that's about that's probably about it. Like I said, there's a bunch of craziness going on in a few places with uh, with spring break, but uh, no, I think we're getting down the road. That's great. Uh, and Kent, we're going to jump to you in a minute, and I want to hear all about the people you've been interviewing because you talk with everybody from around the world, really, as well. Paul, why don't you give us an update on New Zealand? How's that tracking? Thanks, Michelle. Um, my name is Paul Turner. I'm a private practice consultant in uh, just north of Wellington, uh, our capital in New Zealand. And uh, through COVID, we've managed to do pretty well. It's a feature of being such an isolated place, I suppose. Uh, we had a shutdown through April last year for uh, four or five weeks. And uh, all that did was defer some of the, um, the work that we've been very busy doing for a long time and since then it's been uh, it's been frantic uh, we we've had a we've got a rampant property market uh, property prices are um, escalating uh, in fact today the government have announced some more uh, measures to try to uh, what they call the declaring war on property speculation so uh, related to that is naturally the um, employment situation uh, not being able to get specialists. Um, uh, so we've, we're lucky we've got a few Kiwis returning to New Zealand, which is helping things. Uh, I think we're going to have to look at um, the um, uh, skilled migrant status for um, immigrants to help with our shortages. I think the other feature that we've noticed is uh, shifting employment preferences. Uh, I think that's around the world. We're seeing that... Uh, uh, working from home is becoming popular, uh, but I guess we're in a we're in a profession where we need to collaborate, and and that's uh, trying to get the balance between the those changing preferences and um, the right amount of collaboration on land development projects is uh, is a tricky challenge. So yeah, I'm looking forward to um, seeing how others are managing that. Uh, uh, attracting staff uh, dilemma that we face here. Great. Well, yes, and I'm sure that we will talk some about that. Kate, just before I jump to you, I might just, I realised, of course, I should probably talk about Australia because whilst I did this so that we Aussies could learn about all of you, I recognise there's a number of people from the other countries who might be interested in what's happening in Australia. We haven't had any significant cases for quite some time. Victoria went through a couple of major lockdowns. Um, but I was in Victoria last week, and so they all seem to be recovering quite well there. Most of us now can travel pretty much anywhere within Australia. Uh, and so certainly from a surveying perspective, we kept working. In fact, from all reports all around the country, uh, everybody is flat out. And certainly a skill shortage um, is hitting much harder, we think now. Uh, immigration, we, um, we just included, we're, we're a member of the Australian Chamber of Commerce and industry here and they asked for submissions on the challenges with not being able to get immigration through and get our skilled um, workers through that way and we got a mention in that report that went to uh, a joint hearing a joint committee hearing there in, in Canberra the other week uh, and we got mentioned on the nine news on Friday night which is very exciting when surveyors get mentioned on the news um, not for good reasons because we've got a skill shortage but anyway so we're still working on that and advocating to try and see um, surveying returned to the um, import of skills right now we can only have 
10 professions, one being a chef, very important that we can eat well, of course, but uh, not we can't build houses for people to live in, but that's okay. Uh, so uh, COVID-wise, we are doing pretty well and um, the New Zealand bubble has opened and it looks like we can travel to New Zealand and we're hoping that Singapore will soon be added. What about like Fiji and Vanuatu? Like they're places I want to go. Not that I don't want to go to New Zealand, Paul, but just saying. Um, Kate Fairley, I've, I've asked to, to join us. Kate actually does quite a lot of work in developing countries. And so Kate, I thought that you might just talk with us a little bit about what you're seeing from the humanitarian side and what's happening uh, internationally. Oh, can you unmute? Yes. Yeah, there we go. So I wasn't sure if I was unmuting or you were. Um, thanks, Michelle. Hi, everyone. I'm Kate Fairley from Land Equity International. Um, I was a little bit worried initially this morning, Michelle, when I read your email that I was going to have to report on Australia, which I can only report on as someone aspiring to buy a home rather than <laughs> working in the profession. Um, but I do want to say from the start that, yeah, perhaps next time we should um, definitely try and invite some more people from the Pacific or maybe Latin America thinking of time zones. I don't want to be seen to be speaking for anyone else and obviously we need to definitely practice diversity a bit more as a profession so um that's probably my bad I should have suggested someone else as well but um let me just say if we'll get there we're, we're, this is a start the last time it was just yes. us in Canada and seven people so look how far we've come I know this is amazing no <laughs> I think we're all working on it this is just a reminder to us all to to keep working on it um so I work at Equity International as Michelle said we work in basically international development consulting as surveyors predominantly, but also as lawyers and economists, um, policy people um, helping developing countries, World Bank, UN, to basically implement land administration, surveying legislation, um, undertake land titling and registration, you know, from the bottom up as well as from a top down system. Um, and I guess one of our worries moving forward is that a lot of the development money is gonna move to COVID um, so we're already seeing, we're working in Indonesia at the moment, we're already seeing from the local governments there that they're having to divert a lot of their funding to measures to address COVID. Um, and that's moving away from things like spatial planning, which is what we're doing there, as well as away from, you know, their basic surveying and mapping. So I guess that that's a concern in many countries that they're going to lose the money that they've got, they need to invest to have good spatial planning frameworks, to have good um, surveying, have data. Um, in order to then ultimately progress COVID recovery. Um, so that's a concern. I guess another one that I've got playing on my mind is the environment. Um, many, many countries are talking about economic recovery um, or COVID recovery in terms of economics and growth and infrastructure. And that's ultimately going to play out in the loss of forests, biodiversity, um, conservation measures. Um, that's been an ongoing challenge in Australia. It's a challenge in Indonesia. I think we're gonna see that in many countries um, around the world. Um, another comment I wanted to make was in the sense of, of people who are affected, and I think this is true for developed as well as developing countries, and it's that by and large the people that are going to be or are already, you know, the greatest affected by COVID are groups that are already marginalised and already, you know, perhaps struggling. Um, and that's, you know, women from a gender perspective, it's lower socioeconomic groups, um, it's Indigenous groups in both developed and developing countries. Um, and yeah, we, I think as surveyors, we perhaps something that I would like to work on is looking at what is our role in, in particularly addressing that. And that's obviously something that I do day to day when we're trying to make sure that, you know, secure tenure for all um, and hoping to achieve that goal by 2030, which COVID has definitely set back. Um, but I think in developed countries as well, it's something that we should continue to be, think, to be thinking about. Um, uh, I guess as a, a company for us, we're a little bit concerned about getting future projects, but there still seems to be quite a lot of interest and a, a recognition from a number of um, development partners and country governments that they really do need to build on their land administration. So um, I think there's still, there's some hope and there's definitely a lot of interest there. Um, and I guess a final comment that I wanted to make is, is one that's a little bit out there, but it's um, thinking about, you know, environments like Zoom where we are doing a lot more um, online. And I know Tim noted, noted that a lot of us are a bit more introverted and, and perhaps not, not keen to meet people. Um, but I guess the environment of Zoom and online calls is that we typically are having calls with people that we know. Um, so I think that's another, I know FIG is sort of looking to move things online, locate obviously in Australia um, is moving things online. So it's making sure that we are getting out there and being as diverse as possible 
and making connecting with people that we wouldn't otherwise. So whether that's maybe linking more with the planning profession or other neighboring professions, um, other countries, I'd love to see one of those, these sessions, Michelle, with, um, with Africa and Asia and Latin America as well. I think we can definitely work together on that. Um, but yeah, making sure that we're connecting with people that we perhaps wouldn't otherwise that, you know, in normal life or the previous normal life, we might touch base with these people more walking down the street or, you know, more face to face. So that's my my input. I'm not sure if that's what you wanted, but um No, that's great. Thanks, Kate. I think that's right. And I think one of the things I love about you is uh, the diverse approach that you bring. And I think that that's one of the things that we really certainly at um, CSN want to really be talking about and how it is be reaching out a little bit more broadly. So I really Both appreciate that. And so in, in relation to that, that's a great segue for me to bring Kent in because Kent interviews surveyors from all over the world uh, and uh, has a fabulous podcast called Geoholics Anonymous, which I encourage you to listen to if you haven't already. Um, but you might uh, you might want to uh, log into that one and download it and have a good listen. There's a fabulous episode with me and Paul Rollinson back in the history books. Um, but Kent, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you're learning from the various surveyors that you've been interviewing over the last 12 months and the impacts that you've seen? All right. Well, first of all, I want to thank you, Michelle, for inviting me to uh, be a part of this conversation. And I know we talked about it when we had you on. Uh, I can't remember what episode it was, but it was you and Paul Rowlandson. And your energy is absolutely infectious. I got I to gotta put that out there. And that's one of the things I love about you. But from a podcasting perspective, um, you know, I, I think COVID probably um, has, has helped podcasters just because, you know, people were of course, stuck in their houses and what have you and looking for different ways, different media outlets and things like that. And it's amazing. You know, we, we started the podcast about a year and a half ago. And of course, this last year with COVID and everything that has, you know, come along with it, it's, it's really given us another way to connect with people from all over the world, just like Michelle mentioned. And we've talked to a number of surveyors, you know, gosh, I mean, from the UK, from Ireland, from uh, Australia, from Spain. Spain and everybody honestly really echoes everything that's already been said. You know, I, I think that, you know, I think a number of surveyors maybe have been affected in different ways, but all in all, I think we're all kind of, you know, working through it together. We've all experienced the same pain, the same challenges. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's been interesting, but I, I definitely see a light at the end of the tunnel at this point. And uh, I, I'm really excited about, you know, what's going to happen when this is all put behind us. I think it's just, it's going to be, it's going to be unbelievable. I think the energy is going to be great. Um, I think, you know, work for surveyors is not going away or the demand for surveyors is not going away. It's only going to increase. And I know it's on our agenda to talk about it, but, you know, our biggest problem is just finding, finding people to, uh, to fill, fill that need in, within the survey profession. Yeah, and uh, that, that is a challenge internationally, isn't it? Um, we at Consulting Surveyors National did a, we, we do some research every five years into the shortage of surveyors and it's right at the point that it's done, which for us was in December 2018, but we think right now it's like way worse than what we predicted then because that was pre-COVID. As a result of COVID, our government has invested significantly in infrastructure and making sure that the building and construction sector stay strong. As a result, our surveyors are in even higher demand. So I really want to talk about the skill shortage and attracting staff. So one of the things that we're seeing here, I mentioned just before we pressed record, one of our surveyors is on here who's moved organisations. There's probably about three or four that I can see on this call today who I know have moved organisations in the last six months. One of the things we get to see as the association is that kind of movement. Um, and so how are you going at attracting team, attracting staff, getting the people that you need to do the work that you need? Michael, how's it going in Canada there? Um, it, generally, we have the same same issue, um, aging demographic with surveyors, people aging out of the profession and uh, a bit of a struggle to get people into or the the younger generation into those roles. Um, although we are, I think we're doing a couple of proactive things about that. So our, uh, our national examination body has got some federal funding to um, re-examine looking at online potential and remote learning potential for the professional level of surveyor. Uh, you know, thinking uh, 
remote First Nation communities, perhaps parents that can't just pack up and go to a school hundreds of kilometers away to to take education. So they're they're doing that that end. And at Professional Service Canada, we're actually we're hoping we get funding on the technologist side, which of course we need technologists just like we need the professional level. So uh, get in hopes of getting funding that would actually be larger than our annual budget for the purpose of um, re-examining curriculum and opportunities to to uh, advertise our profession and to allow people that to come into surveying that wouldn't n necessarily have that opportunity under the brick and mortar training system we have now. So there's that. Um, in terms of the how uh, I'd say in Alberta, like in Western Canada, there's a lot of reliance on the oil and gas sector, and so the demand for surveyors in this area where where me and Michelle are is is a little lower but certainly if you get outside of Alberta going to places like Ontario um, they're they're in much the same situation as the rest of the world um, where the average age of the surveyor is in the late 50s so looking always looking for more to come in and Michelle, I, I know that you're relatively new to the role and, and, and maybe new to the profession, but do you see any opportunities to get into local high schools, to be encouraging that next generation of student to be choosing a career in surveying? What are you seeing sort of early on as the opportunities in Canada to see more staffing? No, I think Michael and I have talked about this before that, you know, there, there's a difference between geomatics and, and surveying. And so it's trying to educate these this younger group coming in that the need uh, for the surveying profession in Canada is there. And in more so, you know, we're noticing with this upward trend of development and stuff across Canada right now. And the lack of surveyors in, in some areas is that there's unauthorized practice occurring. Mm -hmm. So that's another area that PSC is really, you know, working hard at educating the public that it's important to wait if you have to, to hire a professional surveyor instead of um, using a map or going out and doing it yourself because that could be a costly mistake. Uh, and, and so that's, you know, something that we're, that we're dealing with in, in trying to find, you know, with, with the just not having enough surveyors out there. Yeah, so I suspect that might be a problem everywhere. We certainly experienced that here. I just know in New South Wales, we've just prosecuted two unregistered surveyors for doing work that they were not registered or licensed to do. So uh, that seems to be happening everywhere. Um, Paul, does that happen in New Zealand? What's the staffing like there? And do you have any unregistered people running around doing uh, work? <clears throat> it's only a minor, <clears throat> pardon me. It's only a minor problem. Um, uh, we, we have quite a strict uh, uh, database of uh, licensed surveyors, so yeah, that, that's less of an issue. But in terms of uh, staffing, you know, I, th I think having um, thought about it, uh, chatting with you, Michelle, there are different components to the, uh, to the thinking around attracting staff. Certainly uh, retaining staff is uh, probably a, a better way of um, uh, protecting your assets, you're not having to train new people. Um, I think that's uh, that's something that we could all work on, um, right from the onboarding process through training and support, personal and professional growth. That's uh, uh, that's an area where people feel uh, part of a business. They've got a uh, got a strategy for their personal growth. Um, and as I mentioned before, in terms of shifting preferences, the uh, flexible working. Um, and the, the collaboration, that's, that's going to be an interesting challenge. We've got quite a few of our team who uh, work four days a week, uh, who um, work from home occasionally. Um, and also, uh, I guess another element that is quite common in New Zealand is um, uh, migrants who are working as surveyors. Kate, you might be interested in this. So in my business, for example, one third of our team are uh, from overseas um, with different expertise, not necessarily familiar with the cadastral survey system in New Zealand, but uh, certainly adept at uh, civil engineering and um, uh, they become used to the planning process in New Zealand. So, so I think that's another uh, tool that uh, as 
surveyors, we need to be lobbying government to allow skilled migrant status uh, to improve. So, <coughs> pardon me again. Um, so I think that um, yeah, there, there's a combination of tools that we need to be thinking about. Uh, Michelle, you, you're you uh, very uh, uh, adept at your marketing, as you mentioned before, and I, I think that's a, that's a tool that is very powerful for uh, retaining staff and attracting staff. Um, it's certainly something I learned a lot from discussions with you. I, I think that that is really important. And um, at ACS, we've just started a business academy here in Australia. And we're actually, the whole purpose for ACS and the reason that we have a separate consulting surveyors association in Australia is because we identified 50 years ago that surveyors are really good at doing surveying, maybe not so good at running the business. Yet there is this expectation that once you get your license or your registration, that you will then immediately know how to run the business. But nobody's ever taught you how to do that part. So at ACS, we're actually actively training up surveyors. And I was in Melbourne last week running our academy and we'll be in Brisbane in May um, running that academy as well. And it is one of the key things that we talk about. It's not one of the hot topics. Like if I asked all the surveyors on this call now, you know, what's top of mind for you? Not one of them is going to say marketing their business. It's my my joy that I get to, you know, try and encourage them along. But that is something that we really want to be encouraging. And, you know, as a result of our demand study, um, more than 10 years ago now, that first one, that's what sparked for us the surveying task force. And so there's a surveying task force in most states in, this, in Australia, and we have a national alliance now of those different states. And uh, we are actively trying to promote into schools. And in New South Wales, we've just signed an agreement with the New South Wales Department of Education. And we're actually developing content uh, for an iSTEM component that's going to be taught. It has been taught in schools for a long time. There was a surveying elective that they were thinking about cutting out. But Brian Hammonds, who's here on the call, heard about that and immediately jumped on it <clears throat> and said, no way, you can't cut that. And as a result, we're now developing brand new material that will be taught in schools that we, that we launch at the end of April. So if you saw my LinkedIn post, you'll see we were recording a footage for that for tomorrow, uh, yesterday. Um, so we are actively actually trying to teach about surveying and where STEM subjects and maths particularly is important uh, in school so that we can get that next generation through. But that's going to take us 10 years, right, to get them through and trained and ready to be surveyors. So, Tim, what are you doing in the States about staffing? Is that an issue there? Is there a shortage? And how are you encouraging people to come through the profession? Yes, definitely a shortage. Uh, we do have a pretty good... Uh, pretty good network of schools uh, ranging from the two-year to the four-year uh, programs. Uh, they're starting to become more apprenticeship type of programs out there as well. Um, the problem still lies within the profession itself is that we are, we are, uh, we're invisible and nobody really stands up and, and says anything. I mean, it's, uh, serving isn't as sexy as engineering or architecture. Um, and so, you know, when somebody is looking at, at schools and going, well, I can go to four year of, you know, how many hundreds of thousands of dollars to go to a four year school and I'm going to become a surveyor. No, I'm going to be a, I'm going to be an engineer. I'm going to be an architect. Um, we've got to get past that. Um, and part of the problem is just really the profession itself here promoting itself. We need to get more of our practitioners out there to help do this, to, to get them out and, and in front of the, the potential surveyors that are out there. Because that's, my, that's also one of my main concerns going forward is that let's say we can get a whole bunch of people that want to get interested in surveying. Who's going to teach them? We need to have the, the profession is going to be the ones that are going to have to teach them. Um, and it just, it's been one of those things, uh, technology has been a blessing and a curse that I'm old enough to, from my days, I was in, I was in a two man, three man crew and I learned, I, I went up, I went up the chain literally um, in, in my position and we don't have that now. You hand somebody a $50,000 truck with a robot and a GPS and now drones and say, go get as many data points as you can. And if you could learn something along the way, great. If not, just get me data. 
And that's the wrong message. We, we've got to be able to teach why we're doing what we're doing as well. So uh, it, it, we've got, I mean, we've got an issue and it's just a matter of how we're going to package ourselves going forward to basically become uninvisible. Um, everybody, every surveyor you ever talk to and, and every, everybody on this call will tell you, see the comment surveying is sexy yes it is sexy uh <laughs> surveyors love their jobs um but how do we promote that really really promote that and make it sound very uh very effective and very real uh to that next that next group um and you're right you if you're talking to uh if you're talking to high school students yes you're still talking a five to seven to ten year really uh, educational period to get get that next group in um, we need to be talking to to young young adults that are still trying to figure some things out that uh, we just need to figure out how to reinvent ourselves um, and bottom line is you know part of this is also where surveying is now with the technology versus where it was when I started and as I'm second generation surveyor so when my father started and be and beyond, there's so many more things that surveyors do now that we, we have to open it up to all genders, all races, all classes of people that uh, I think that's also part of the problem here uh, in the United States is that we've got a class problem that if you talk to somebody from a more affluent part of the town, I mean, take for Chicago, for instance, if I go on the north side to the affluent part, those kids aren't going to listen to me because they're going to go to the higher end colleges and they're going to become doctors, lawyers, and whatever. If I go to the South side where it's a little less affluent, I'm an older white man. They don't trust me. And why the heck would I want to be like you? So we also have to, to bridge that gap as well, that this is a job that you can enjoy being outside. You can enjoy computers. You can enjoy technology, history, all of these things. And it transcends race, color, creed, all of these things. So get off my soapbox, but uh, it, we've, got, we've got to figure out how to market ourselves better or we're not going to, we're not going to succeed in, in, in get going forward. I think you've sparked a whole lot of thought and uh, interest there, Tim. And I think if I let them all unplug their mics now, you'd, we'd have lots of back and forward. And so that's great. Um, I think that there's a, there's a lot of good that you said there. Paul, you want to contribute then? Yeah, just uh, taking on Tim's thought there was that um, essentially our social media interaction and our website, for example, are tools to be attracting people. Um, and... I agree with Timothy that uh, you know the the uh, bald white guys. Uh, you know, the, we need to be thinking about the other uh, parts of our toolbox. Um, the, our current staff are probably some of the tools that we should be using to uh, attract people because it's the culture of a business that's that's important. So yeah, our our website. Um, <clears throat> I think everybody's website probably needs an update, but ours does. And uh, we're looking to reinvigorate that in terms of uh, attracting people. Mm, that's great. That's great. Kate, what do you see? You mentioned diversity earlier. And I mean, you know, I just had a bit of a flick through the channel here to see. And it's great to see a couple of girls. Thanks, girls. Nice to have you here. But generally speaking, not that they're all bald. Angus still has quite a bit of hair. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, otherwise, you know, that, that's a pr pretty, pretty true statement there. How do you think we're going at the diversity stakes uh, across the vein on a global level? Wow. Well, that's it. That's it. That's an easy question, Michelle. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm joking. Um, I think we're improving um, and we've definitely had a strong focus on getting more women in. Um, but I think someone, maybe it was Paul mentioned retaining staff is critical. Um, and I think we're possibly failing a little bit at retaining female staff and also adequately promoting female staff and recognizing the range of skills that, that women bring as well as men. And I guess it's not so much that women have and men have, but we, we tend to prioritize or you know, put on a pedestal more masculine qualities, and this is true as a society, but we don't, we don't sort of put on that pedestal a lot of feminine traits. Um, and I'm thinking of the way that you know, 
um, you know, more traditionally feminine leadership styles versus masculine styles and that kind of thing. So I think, I guess my general comment to survey is, is more around the social skills. Um, and that's something that in the international development space, we work a lot with social scientists and a lot more in the social space, understanding um, the social implications of the technology we use, not just the accuracy and the precision. And it's something that we tend to recognize less in developed countries. And I think that would be something really useful for surveyors to, to get across. Um, on other diversity stakes, uh, something that I'm trying to push a lot in Australia is, is um, what well, as of the last month, I haven't done that much, but I'd like to see a lot more on is um, promoting more um, of the way that surveyors um, can support First Nations, recognizing more of the First Nations people, Indigenous peoples that um, are surveyors, but also who are maybe using or uh, recognizing their traditional knowledge a lot more. And I think that's something that's probably true for Canada and the US as well as Australia. Um, but I think there's also a role that surveyors have in promoting First Nations interests. I heard a, a statistic in The Guardian from last year, which is that in New South Wales, there's 37,000 native title claims that are still um, outstanding. Um, so that's a huge backlog that, you know, is obviously a government role, but I think that that's something as, as a professional, as a profession and as the professional bodies in New South Wales, we can probably do something about. I know Narelle Underwood's done a lot on geographical names and that's, you know, amazing work, really important. But um, the onus is really on individual Indigenous groups and peoples to undertake the community consultation and identify where those names need to be changed. So that's something that as a profession we could probably support rather than putting all the burden on them. And that's something that as a, di a diversity challenge for surveyors is that we often say, okay, we need diversity. Let's get these women to talk. Let's get these um, Indigenous people to talk. So we put a lot of burden on a few individuals. Um, I just think Australians, how many times you've perhaps seen Narelle Underwood's face over the last week or year. Um, she is shouldering a huge amount um, and that's part of her job, but it's also a lot that she's doing, you know, over and above um, what her day-to-day -day job is. So I guess it's recognising when we're making um, the diverse peoples shoulder the burden of promoting diversity. And so it's what can we do to, to amplify, to support them. Um, so that's probably my comments on diversity. I had a couple of other comments and Tim, amazing. Thank you for all of those thoughts. Um, in terms of internationally, we talk about this global shortage, but I want to highlight two countries where there isn't a shortage of surveyors, and they are Nigeria and Turkey. I don't know if they're the only two, but um, those two countries, there's a number of young surveyors that are actually seeking work. Um, and I'm assuming globally that COVID's maybe made that more difficult in some countries. Maybe not everywhere is experiencing this property boom that we've got um, in Canada, the US and Australia. So um, definitely, I think Paul made the point about um, surveyors advocating for um, migration um, and working with government to enable that migration, but also working on our mutual recognition policies so that it's not impossible or incredibly difficult to requalify or recertify in a new country. Recognizing that obviously as cadastral surveyors, um, you may need to get across local laws, but how do we make that process smoother? And that's something I've worked on with the FIG before, and there's a few publications on that and a lot of work being done. Um, another point that I wanted to make was around this idea that we need to get more surveyors in um, to help with the shortage. And I think one way that we can perhaps promote, and this is a bit out there maybe, is thinking about the democratization of what we do. Um, and I know we're very precious as surveyors. We like to think that we're the only ones that can do everything, but there are some things that require high accuracy, high precision, and there's other things that don't. And I guess one example I can think of is that there's a lot of, um, Indigenous First Nation sites um, in Australia in particular that maybe have fuzzy boundaries that we don't adequately have knowledge around um, for spatial planning and for infrastructure purposes. How can we help um, the First Nations groups to, you know, map their own sites? And this is something we do in international development and it's perfectly acceptable to do fit for purpose surveying in, you know, Laos or Cambodia, but it's not considered to be as acceptable in Australia and the US. Um, or Canada, you know, I can name a number of other countries. So I think that's something we also need to think about. And by democratizing things, we can help to promote our profession. Um, just think if everyone who was using a drone also felt like they were a surveyor um, rather than wanting to get into aerospace engineering. So it's how do we, we start pushing surveying into these other fields? And that's something I think Craig maybe has been doing in UNSW, correct me if I'm wrong, which is maybe pushing surveying courses into 
other disciplines within engineering. So within civil engineering, within aerospace, within mechanical engineering, making sure that each of those recognizes how they use surveying thinking. Um, okay, I'll leave it there. Great, thanks, Kate. Yeah, go team. I, I have to follow Kate for a second because uh, between Kate and I think Claire was somewhere on here and there's there were, uh, any of the other young surveyors that that back in January that put on uh, the volunteer surveying program through FIG, um, I questioned doing this because it was two o'clock in the morning when it was going on for me on this worldwide thing, but it was two four hour sessions that was wonderful. Um, that the passion that I hear in Kate's voice right now, she lives it and it, all of them that put these these programs on it was amazing how well they did and what they what what they how they promoted themselves in this this volunteer organization um so kudos to uk kudos to claire and and it, all any of the other ones that were on here it was fantastic i i i, I write a uh a, a bi-monthly article for GPS world. And I wrote about my experience and how much it opened my eyes. And she's exactly right that there are other countries we need to be worrying about. There are other places and other things that we need to be worrying about that. I know when I go, when I go out and work, I take them for granted um, that th these are the types of things that she's exactly, she's exactly right. So kudos to that group and uh, please keep pushing along. That was, that was some great stuff. Awesome. Well, as you can see, we could have picked a whole lot of topics that we could just spend hours and hours talking about and trying to solve across the globe. And there have been many who have contributed via the chat. So make sure that you're keeping up and reading that chat. And I know that I could have called on any one of you to help answer some of these questions and contribute. And hopefully, you know, we will do more of these kinds of calls because I think that it is important to get that message out as broadly as we can. I want to pick up one last little topic. And then if we've got time, we'll do some questions but we always have to talk about pricing right pricing and people kind of the two biggest issues okay usually that's what I come across anyway so uh, we just recently in Australia did our national hourly rate survey and given all that we have just talked about so we've got uh, you know there's so much work going on we're, we're overloaded with the work we've got all this new technology we're flying drones we're doing all this stuff uh, isn't it great we've got a skill shortage so why are our rates the same as they have been for the last five, 10 years. Certainly a problem we face here in Australia. Uh, it's almost like we are competing to get to the bottom lowest price. Uh, why do we do that as a professional service? I think it goes back to one of the things Timmy mentioned before, uh, you know, around that the way we see ourselves. We don't see ourselves on the same level as architects and engineers. I mean, when I say that you guys are the specialists of engineering, the specialists of architecture, you know, specialists in the law profession and specialists in the medical profession charge triple. So why do we charge half? Is that a, is that a challenge, Michael, in Canada? Yeah, there's all there's always been the race to the bottom, and it depends on the particular part of the survey industry you're in. Like those that are doing house surveys for for resale purposes are. Are often the ones that are competing with themselves and now, even nowadays they're competing, competing with insurance products as opposed to each other it, at the professional level those that would market themselves as um, land information consultants or the those that help businesses or individuals with the the process and the data uh, not so i don't think there is the same level there of of racing to the bottom it's just depends on what part of the market that you put yourself yourself in i was looking at our at the alberta numbers keeping in mind we had the oil and gas um down tick but 2018 our average surveyor made 124,000 canadian in a year and that's in the 2021 survey that's down to 114,000 with a with a steady decline even there so i and i'm not sure if that's the further devaluation of our services or if that's just the people retiring at the top end of the the spectrum but yeah we we do see some downtick i don't i'm probably repeating myself now but at the top professional level those that market themselves as value added i think that the prices are still going up at least with the cost of living 
And Kent, you interview people um, regularly and I hear the discussion of pricing come up occasionally in the webinars. What's your kind of take on that from what you're seeing from those that you interview? Yeah, I mean, it's that's a touchy subject. Um, it's very unfortunate that, you know, we... Uh, you know, we want our we want to hold ourselves to a uh, a certain level of professionalism, but for whatever reason, there's you know a, a percentage of of surveyors that um, continue to devalue the services that they provide. And you know, I, I don't know what the solution is, um, but you know, it's it's a problem across the board, no doubt about it. You know, I think the important thing is that if we want to you know, be considered professionals, we need to, you know, act like professionals. We need to, of course, be experts in our field and build value in, in what we do. I mean, it's, it's up to us to do that. It's, it's easy to be the guy that, uh, you know, provides professional services for pennies on the dollar, but, you know, that's just completely counterproductive and it's, it's hurting the whole profession. Um, and, you know, everybody we talk to about it expresses the exact same concerns. Yeah, um, you know, I, I don't know what the solution is. I really don't. But it, it is definitely an issue. And, uh, you know, all, all we can do is, uh, is, is work at being better. You know, just I think, it's, I think it's really, really important that you take the time to educate your clients. And if you take the time to do that, um, more times than not, they're willing to pay a little bit more for the service. Right, Paul, New Zealand. You don't have pricing issues over there, do you? You're all, you're all squillionaires, right? Uh, no, we're um, we don't have too much of a problem there. I agree with Kent um, that to value the profession, we've got to um, maintain the quality of our our output and and uh, essentially educate our clients about the value of that. Those that uh, uh, charge low for the work they do, they're clearly getting in and out and um, not uh, uh, producing high quality work, <coughs> pardon me. I think at the moment what we're noticing <coughs> in New Zealand is that uh, there's a, such a high demand that our uh, salaries are rising, uh, therefore our hourly rates are rising. Uh, customers are really more interested in when we can do a project, not what it will cost. So there's, uh, uh, the thing that worries me, I guess, is, is down the line how sustainable uh, well, the related uh, increases in uh, salaries are to property prices and so on. We're, in, we're getting into an awkward situation and at some point in the future we're going to have some challenges. Uh, but right now it's not really a problem in terms of um, uh, the valuing the profession. Uh, Michael Gadici, our Surveyor General down in Tasmania, just made a good point in the chat there that we are professionals in the office and tradies in the field, except that professionals go into the field as well, don't they? One of the things that we're going to talk about at our national conference in June in Cape Shank, beautiful Victoria, for those of you who haven't registered yet, make sure you get online and register for that one. Paul, you might be able to come, how exciting, um, uh, is, uh, you know, a discussion around the terminology and the way we talk about ourselves and we, we sort of have this tiering problem that we've challenged with our Bureau of Statistics here and sort of there's a surveyor and, you know, we've got building surveyors and land surveyors and then there's the different levels of surveying and there's so many different um, uh, challenges there and, and surveyor means different things. And so, you know, is that is that why we have this pricing problem and how can we challenge that? And I noticed a number of you talk about professional surveyors. We talk about registered or licensed surveyors here. Uh, and so I wonder if there's a terminology piece that we need to have a discussion about internationally on a global level. Kate's, Kate's not sure about that. She's, she's not sure. So, uh, you know, that's an interesting um, piece that maybe we need to you know just better communicate who we are and what we do but I certainly think that you're all skilled and should charge more just add a zero everybody add a zero um I might just call on Craig Turner on behalf of Consulting Surveyors National just to add some comments I've been adding all the Australian stuff but you know I'm not a surveyor right did I not mention that Craig you better you better share on the Australian perspective on what you've heard today on behalf of our board yeah, look, I, I must admit I've been in and out uh, of the conversation because like 
uh, probably many of you, there's been a few fires I've had to put out this morning. Plans. And uh, I, I will be quick because I do have another meeting in a couple of minutes. Look, I've, I've, Michelle and I, we've, we've just recently come back from Melbourne where we were running a, a, a workshop. Uh, I do a number of presentations at different events uh, on the business side and on profitability and I'm listening to sort of what people are talking about here, it seems we've got the same issues um, across the world, not just here in Australia, but obviously across the Tasman and over in Canada. For me, and, and this is for those that, uh, when I've done my presentations will know, I, I, I don't think we should be looking at pricing as being an issue. I think we've got to look at business profitability as the issue. And the idea being what profitability should a survey consultancy be making? And that's at a normalised profit, and that should be at about 20 to 30%. How you get to that, well, that's for the business person to work out. For those that invest in you know, some R&D, for those that may have great processes in place, for those that may have highly trained staff, they may actually be able to get a, a great profit with a lower price, so to speak, because of just the systems they've got in place. The person who runs out of the back of a garage, out of the back of a truck, no process in place, doesn't time, uh, doesn't manage their time, may not even track their time, they may actually have to charge a higher price to get the same return. So I think what we should be looking at as a professional service firm for all the risk that we put in uh, in running our businesses and all the time that we put in and all the stresses that it has, it's not what we should be charging, it's what our business should be making. And then the business owner can work out, well, how do I get that return? Now, for some, they're gonna say, I'm gonna get that return by cutting corners, you know, reducing my work health and safety by employing unqualified staff, not checking my work. Well, that's the call of the business owner. And they can run that risk and they can have a business that may not be highly valued within the profession or the community. But for others who wanna invest uh, in their staff, and I, we spoke a bit about culture and culture is key. I think um, Peter Drucker said, culture each strategy for breakfast. You know, they're the, they're the firms that suddenly get recognised, people want to come and work for them. Um, but they also then have to work at saying, well, how do I get that profitability? And, and in, in New South Wales, where I'm based, for the evidence that I see, most surveying businesses uh, from a profitability point of view, normalise, so that's removing any tax effective strategies that you should have in place, um, are performing very, very poorly. And then you see that translated because of the rates that they are charging. So I think let's flip it, let's rethink it, and it should be what should my business be making rather than but part of the issue of low fees will also translate then to a low business profitability. Thanks, Craig. And uh, I, I thought it was really important to have Craig speak because, you know, at the Association of Consulting Surveyors, our focus is on the business of surveying. We recognise that you employ surveyors, planners, architects, engineers, a whole host of people within the organisations that you work for. And our focus is on making sure that you have profitable, successful businesses. Uh, it's our strategic goal to see thriving surveying businesses across Australia. And if we can help others globally do that, then that's what we want to do. That's why, Paul, you and I, we talk about marketing so much because we think it really is key. So, uh, you know, if we're, if we're going to turn this conversation around and we're going to really make sure that we are the respected profession, that our profession does go on forever and ever, uh, as it has started from the very beginning, then we need to be having these kinds of discussions. So look, I do hope that you have found this morning very helpful. Um, I would just ask those of you that have podcasts, would you post them in the chat for everybody to know? So Kent, we've got Geoholics. Tim, I think you've got one. Peter Cox, who's on the call. Peter, would you post a link to your Defining Boundaries podcast? That is a place where we, It's isn't it exciting? Surveyors, podcasts, really? Is there something we can talk about? Apparently so. I mean, Kent's podcast is like an hour and a half long. I have to listen to it at time and a half to get through it. So, you know, really, um, when you're out there, you're working, listen to this kind of stuff, but share the message. You know, whose podcast can we get on? Where can we go more, more broadly to share that message and get that message out? I hope that you have found today encouraging as you go out and celebrate Global Surveyors Day. And for those of you on the other side of the planet, you can celebrate tomorrow as well. We'll celebrate today. You can celebrate tomorrow. 
tomorrow, uh, that will be great. And uh, we do thank you all so much for joining. I'm sorry we didn't have time for questions. There's obviously a lot to talk about and we could have included so many more of you. Um, so thank you all so much for being with us. We really appreciate your time. Thank you to our guests who spoke so eloquently and so passionately about the profession that you all love so much. We love surveying. Surveying is sexy. So go out there and have a fabulous day and change the world right where you are. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Michelle.